So, Mark here from Rock and Load. This evening we are joined by the one, the only, Mr. Jack J. Hutchinson, blues rock guitarist extraordinaire. Uh, how are you doing, Jack? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm great, great. It's great to actually finally get the chance to talk to you because um, you've been all across my socials for a long time and I've never really had the chance. And I don't think you've been to Northern Ireland, have you? Not yet, no. Not yet. Uh, yeah, hopefully yeah. in the future, yeah. Cool. We'll get you across someday. Figure it out one way or another. Um, so, Jack, look, listen, as it is our first time talking, give us a bit of a, a bit of background to yourself for anybody who's unfamiliar with you. Um, what's your history? So, look, when, when did you pick up the guitar, etc.? Yeah, so I, I grew up in a town called Burnley, and uh, I guess I started playing guitar when I was maybe about 11, 12, that sort of age. And, um, yeah, I got a guitar for Christmas, and I was going to these sort of classical guitar lessons, and uh, I never really loved the classical guitar element of it. And uh, I actually hated going to guitar lessons. I actually dreaded it. Every Monday evening, I used to dread going to these guitar lessons. And I, I actually wanted to be out playing football with my mates. But um, as soon as I stopped doing the guitar lessons, and then it was sort of the onus was on me to learn how to play it properly. I, I think that's when the enthusiasm grew. And, um, you know, both of my parents are big rock and roll fans. And so you know, my dad's a big ACDC fan, a Rolling Stones fan. So I, I'd listened to that music since I was a kid. So, um, yeah, when I started to play guitar, he, he was quite encouraging, really, because as soon as I, you know, learned how to play stuff like Wild Horses, I remember my dad being completely over the moon that I'd learned how <laughs> to play that song. So um, I was very lucky in that I had parents that encouraged it, really. Yeah, cool. Uh, the lesson side of thing, it's interesting that you 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 didn't really uh, run towards it. You ran away from it more than anything else. Uh, was it the was it the the classical music itself, or was it maybe just that tedious sort of? I suppose like the classical is quite a disciplined instrument, more than anything else. Yeah, I mean, I've I've never done particularly well at being told what to do, and I think that was part of it as well. And actually, the classical guitar stuff was very difficult, so. Um, you know, when I started learning like Satisfaction by the Stones, that seemed somewhat easier. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it probably held me in good stead in terms of my teenage years when I, I was what you would class as a lead guitarist in bands. I didn't sing. I, I was mainly a guitar player. So all of that technical stuff that I learned early on, I guess, was then ingrained in me, even though I absolutely despised the lessons. So it, it held me in good stead going forwards. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so what age then did you start uh, venturing out and gigging? I was pretty young. I, I remember doing, I think I was probably 14 or 15 when I did my first gig. And, um, you know, it was one of these where we were going into pubs around Lancashire. And I think it probably fibbing about how old I was to get in and play these shows <laughs> and sneaking a few pints after I'd played and being absolutely plastered and then getting in and my mum saying, have you been drinking tonight? And then pretending that I, I hadn't um so yeah I was pretty young and it, it's funny because I think at that age you've got this sort of fearlessness about yourself and you you know you don't really see the the size of the venues that you're playing and we did quite a few big festivals I guess when I was about 15 16 and now I'd probably get quite nervous about it but at that age you, you do think genuinely that you are bloody brilliant so you just go out and do it and um yeah so I look back very fondly on on that period of my life. Really, it was a lot, yeah. a lot of good fun. As you say, youth is wasted on the young, isn't it? You know that um, bravado that you get when you're just a teenager, and you like, yeah, I'll do that, no problem. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny because we just did uh, Winter's End this week, uh, planning about Winter's End, and there's a, quite a few younger bands like uh, Etherfield were playing, and they remind me a, a lot of myself, sort of, you know, yeah. quite a few years ago now, and. Um, they just take it in their stride and, you know, we're, we're backstage going, so we've all got that part of that song down. Right. And, and, and you overthink it, I think when yeah, you get a yeah. bit older. So there's something really great about that kind of, um, I, I guess I use the word naivety, but not in a bad way. It's that kind yeah. of, yeah, you just take it for granted, I suppose. Yeah. That's the best way to be best way to be. Cause obviously, as you say, as, as we get older, you know, I think we just become more limited. You know, we just constantly worry about everything. It's all about perfection rather than the journey. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, and you start worrying about various other stuff. You know, you, it's like, oh, my God, I've forgotten my beard oils. You know, that becomes a big <laughs> thing before the show. Whereas, you know, I, I don't think I used, to, when I did my first tours, I don't think I washed for two weeks. It was just yeah. like, it was rock and roll, man. And yeah. you get in and, you, and your girlfriend's like, oh, my God, what has happened to you? <laughs> Uh, you look like Tom Hanks from Castaway. So yeah. Anyway, 
the joy. Hygiene's the joy. improved as the years have gone on. Well, that's one thing. One thing. Um, <laughs> so, like at fifteen, uh, as you say, massive learning curve. I'm sure doing that whole gigging thing and going from venue to venue and just let, learning the ropes because it's it's there's so much to actually take in as a young musician, isn't there? Yeah, and I think a lot of the venues we played were were like working men's clubs around Burnley and Blackburn and you know, rotten stall and those sorts of places. And so that some of those venues were quite tough. You know, I remember playing a show where we couldn't for the like, we bought this, this um, PA system off. We found it in loot. You know, we actually bought the physical loot magazine and, and uh, bought this PA and this whole thing just basically exploded halfway through the gig. And I remember this guy slamming his pint down and walking towards the stage. And he said, you know, if you do that again, because he obviously popped his ears, he said, if you do that again, I'm going to smash your face in. And we're all like, <laughs> oh, my God, you know, bunch of 15 year old lads thinking that we're, you know, Mick and Keith, but actually then thinking, Daddy, get us out of here. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, it was. Yeah, I think that was good to play those rough venues because, um, you know, it, it meant that even now like if stuff goes wrong at a gig it won't compare to some of the stuff that happened when i was a kid when i was gigging so yeah, yeah it's it's all it's all uh experience isn't it like it's every day's a school day and you take it with you yeah absolutely man yeah and what sort of gear were you using back then like when you were younger what sort of stuff were you were you lugging around with you and, and playing through well it's funny actually i haven't really changed my rig really in 20 years i mean um this is a, this cab here which is a Marshall DSL 100. I I got for my I think it was probably 16th birthday. I got one of the JCM 2000s, so an original 100 watt JCM 2000. Um, and I've used those amps ever since, really. And then I just upgraded this a couple of years ago. I I really like the sound of those amps. Um, and so I was using a Les Paul. I I got into um I had an Epiphone Les Paul back then, and I was obsessed with uh. You know, lots of my heroes were playing Les Pauls. So Slash, Jimmy Page, Zach Wilde all seemed to be playing that guitar. Um, so, yeah, I had an Epiphone that my dad bought me. And then I remember working, I, I think it was across two summers to save up the money to get a, a Gibson. Um, and so for 20 odd years, I've, I've used the same rig. And so Les Pauls and uh, Marshalls have been been my thing. And uh it's funny because I, I did a tour with Chris Barris a couple of years back and I know Chris was on your show, wasn't he, recently? He's the, he's the devil using Kemper. He's the devil. Uh, yeah, well, we had a conversation <laughs> about this because because I got my, you know, I'm loading in this ginormous Marshall amp that weighs a ton. And Chris was like, you know, you can get that sound through a, a Kemper. And, I, and I, I turned around and I said, well, you can also get it through a Marshall. <laughs> you yeah, know, it's like, yeah. well, if I get a Kemper, I only want that Marshall tone. So, um yeah, I mean, Chris really knows his stuff about gear, so uh, who am I to question him in terms of those Kemper amps? But I do really love th these Marshalls and, uh, yeah, Marshall JCM 2000s with the original rig. And I had one of the little ones, one of the 40-watt ones, but it kept blowing up for some reason. I think that particular line back in the 90s had a had a few issues on the, on the combos, which um, was to do with the sort of the wiring and the, they perhaps were kind of overloading the system a little bit yeah but yeah. it didn't really matter to me it was almost like it was at that tipping point all the time and it it would run for about three months and then go again but it, it's the sound of that little amp was brilliant um so yeah but yeah i've always been a marshall's guy yeah and like have you have you tried other stuff have you just have you are you just been faithful to the marshall has just done what it's it's done for you it's been a workhorse and, and been or have you like experimented yeah, I mean, in the studio, we use different amps and, um, you know, my new album, when we recorded down at Momentum Studios in Plymouth and we used um, some orange, orange amps on that record. And um, I remember we used a Telecaster mainly to do some of the sort of rhythm guitar stuff just to because we were doing the sort of, um, you know, panning across the two channels. And, uh, you know, you don't want just the repetition of having the Les Paul and the Marshall. So yeah. we use Telecaster. I think I use a Strat on it as well, which at the point uh, where they brought this Strat out, I thought it was like sacrilegious using a Stratocaster because I'm really not a fan of them. But actually, when you hear it in the mix with the Les yeah. Paul, it does sound great. So yeah. um, I wouldn't say I'm kind of like one of these guys that's like I'm not going to ever use any other gear. Um, but, you know, my, my live rig at the moment, I've been using... There's one here actually. Uh, 
I've been using this wild audio guitar, which I picked up on eBay about maybe three years ago now. And um, the reason I like this is it's a, it's a little bit lighter than Les Paul. So what you get here with, is something that's not going to kill you back if you're doing a two hour show, despite yeah. the fact it's absolutely ginormous. Um, yeah, I mean, the Les Paul that I've got here, you you feel the weight of this. I mean, when you when you've had that on your your shoulder for two hours, it it does give you a bit of backache. I'm I always sure. remember um, Jimmy Page when he went on on tour with the Black Crows, and he sort of uh, he had to cancel some shows because of having a bad back. And I thought, God, that's a really like what what the hell's that about? But he played Les Pauls for thirty years. No wonder he had a bad back. Yeah, probably has a hump. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and so what, what, what was it? Was, was it because of your, your idols basically were playing Les Paul and that just sort of pulled you in from an early age? Yeah, I, th- I seem to remember, I guess now, you know, you don't get this sort of exposure on, on channels like NTV, but I remember seeing stuff like the November Rain video when I was probably about, I guess I was about eight or nine when I saw that on TV. And you see Slash on this sort of, you know, this kind of like deserted sort of, just outside the chapel playing yeah. a Les Paul and I just was completely blown away by it yeah. and uh, I remember getting Song Remains the Same for my 15th birthday and just being transfixed by all that footage of you know Jimmy Page using the violin bow on the Les, uh, Les Paul and I, I just thought it was uh, I became obsessed with getting a Honey Burst Les Paul on the basis of watching Song Remains the Same so I think you know everybody's got idols haven't they and I think yeah. You know, the Les Paul has been attached to quite a, a lot of significant players over the years. Um, and so, you know, people of, you know, my generation, perhaps the generation beforehand, they were, the Les Paul was a really special guitar for, for a lot of us. Um, so, yeah, I absolutely love it. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. We, we never know as time progresses, because obviously the younger guitar players coming through now are all using weird ass shit. Like you've got to- Tosin Abassi on his eighth string and, the guys from Polyphia with like Ibanez AZ. So in 20, 30 years time, are they going to be the iconic guitars or will the, the Gibson and the, the Strat still hold their own in time to come? I remember when my bass player turned up at rehearsals, he, he's endorsed by Overwater and he got this like five string bass and he'd been using a four string up until that point. And I was just like, mate, what, what are you thinking? Getting an extra string. And I said, what, do you need that extra string? And he said, yeah, absolutely. He gave me this long explanation as to why he needed this extra string. And I said, it's all, you got all the notes already, man. Like, do you really need, it's like guitar to use seven strings. It's not never been my cup of tea really. So I guess I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably known for having quite strong blues roots as well. So that kind of traditional side of things is, has been ingrained in me over the years. And, you know, um, I don't think Magic Sam was was using a seven string guitar with VMGs in it, was he? So um, yeah, that's yeah, probably yeah. where I'm at. <laughs> and and sort of influences wise and musically. So you're you're touching the earth. You have a bit of blues roots. Were you listened to a lot of blues then when you were younger? Yeah, it was weird at the time, I suppose, because um, you know I got into Zeppelin when I was, I guess, about fourteen, fifteen. As I say, I got Song Remains the Same uh, on VHS for my fifteenth birthday. I remember watching that sort of like midnight. I'd, I'd been on a school trip to London and um, yeah, my mum had, mum gave me this present when I got back in at, at the end of the trip and I ended up just watching it really late at night. But what was great about that was it, it, it sort of opened the door to a lot of other artists for me. Like a lot of people who get into Zeppelin, you, um, you start to investigate the guys that influenced them. And I remember getting the BBC Sessions uh, album that Zep put out in the late 90s and looking at the the liner notes of that and seeing you know all the artists all the old blues guys that they were covering on that record I suppose at that point they'd been forced to actually acknowledge who they'd ripped off but you know <laughs> whatever um, so then that, that just started a massive journey for me of, of discovering all these really old school blues guys and it was a bit weird I suppose because growing up in Burnley at that point all my mates were listening to Britpop and listening to Oasis were a big band, you know, and I, I played Oasis in bands, you know, that a lot of the um, guys I hung out with were just obsessed with that sort of music. But I did listen to that, but I was also at the same time listening to B.B. King and Muddy Waters and Magic Sound. Robert, I'm trying to work out Robert Johnson. I mean, that guy was like a, a full band in one guy. And yeah. um, so the blues has definitely infused 
most of what I've done since. And heavily inf influenced your songwriting then moving forward as well? Yeah, I mean, very early on, I think songwriting was the main focus. And I, I straight away was trying to write music when I picked up a guitar. So that was always my interest, really. Um, and even in the bands I was, I was in as a teenager, although I wasn't the singer, I would, you know, record demos and we would we would perform my songs. And so, you know, I, I've probably got, you know, um, some of this stuff. If I ever run out of ideas, I can maybe return back to it. Um, but yeah, it was it was quite quite a good experience to try and like a lot of people when they when they first start writing songs, you actually just you kind of copy other people. So yeah. most of those tracks just sound like Elmore James Shaky Money Maker, which isn't too adventurous. But then you just evolve and then you you put your own spin on things. Um, so yeah, it, it still to this day influences me blues music despite what some people might think in my new record, which is a bit heavier, but yeah. Yeah, but I suppose it's, all, it's always an evolution, isn't it? You know, as an artist, um, you can't just keep on regurgitating the same stuff all the time. So you sort of want to diversify a little bit and uh, express yourself, I suppose, as well, creatively. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I've, I've actually just been, just before we came on this call, I've been writing a song this afternoon, which is, is a little bit more bluesy. And although my new record isn't particularly blues orientated, you could dissect the tracks and then say, well, actually, most of the scales and the and the, the, the different chord structures are quite blues orientated. But yeah, I've never been particularly keen on just repeating myself. And, you know, it's like there's, there's some artists that can just churn records out and they kind of all just meld into one for me. Yeah. And I don't set out with a, an idea going, I'm going to definitely make a different record. You just write what you write and then it, it forms an album at the end of it. Um, but yeah, I think that, I think some people struggle with that actually. They, you know, they, they find it difficult when they, they associate you with, with a particular genre and a, a particular performance. I mean, I got, I got known, I think initially for doing acoustic blues and people used to come and see me perform and I, I don't drink now, but I did back then. And a lot of my shows were really me getting drunk on stage and, it was almost like a comedy routine as well as the acoustic stuff. And then I got to the point where I just thought, well, actually, I don't really want to be that guy. I don't want to be this, this dickhead on stage, you know, practically falling off a chair. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I evolved and became a different type of player. So, yeah, that's kind of who I am now. Yeah. And so what's at what sort of stage then did you decide to step away, as you say, from that band life and uh, doing the covers and stuff and then want to be a, a, a solo recording artist? Yeah, it was a bit, I suppose the, the period of that happening was um, like a lot of people, you, you go through, um, I think that a lot of bands last about two or three years and then they kind of implode. Everybody gets on each other's nerves. The first year, most bands are like, yeah, we're going to be the greatest band on the planet. Then they kind of hit a certain level and then people just start falling out. And I kind of went through that maybe three or four times when I was in my late teens and early 20s. But I was never the front man in these bands. And actually what happened on quite a few occasions was I was in bands with singers who thought they were like David Lee Roth when actually they were more like Rabsy Nesbitt. So it was a bit <laughs> like, I was just like, so quite a few times I ended up singing at gigs because these knobheads just, one, one gig, this guy just didn't show up. And so what was really funny about that was then I got featured on this uh on the on the cover of this magazine that performing at this uh, festival and the lead singer was really arsy with me and he said you know I can't believe that uh, you're getting all the attention and I said well I turned up and played the show so it just got to the point where I thought sod this I, I'm going to learn how to sing properly and and be the front man and I still don't see myself really as a singer I've always, for me I'm all, I've always been a guitarist and a songwriter but yeah when you've been through all those those periods with um you know, the lead singers in spandex jumping around like they're in the li living on a prayer video and just we've had enough of it. So that's why I ended up becoming a solo artist. <laughs> yeah. And, and did you ever like to uh, get vocal training at all or get anything to, 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 to sort of focus on and on the instrument? Not really. But then um, it's funny because Laz and Felipe, who are my, my current bandmates, when they joined me, which is actually probably about three and a half years ago now, four years ago, They've come from a very kind of um, tutored 
music school background, whereas I haven't. You know, I've ne- I, I, you know, I can play all my songs, but I couldn't tell you all the chord structures and different things that I I apply in them. Whereas they can. So when we go in the studio, particularly Laz, he's quite smug about things and he'll just be <laughs> dissecting it and he'll say, well, actually, this this there was a similar usage of this in a trivium song. And I'm like, I don't even know trivium, are mate. But um, so one of the things that uh, Laz was very good at is uh, his wife is actually a vocal coach. So we had a lot of discussions about um, kind of I think what they could see on the first tour they did with me, we headed to Spain and did this two week tour. You know, and I'm I'm out there for like two hours, two and a half hours each night, hitting the whiskies afterwards. And, you know, by the end of that 14 day tour, my, I sounded like, you know, I sounded like the Burnley manager. My voice was completely shattered. And, and Laz said, look, if you want to just have a, a conversation and we can talk about how to look after your voice better. And I had a, a good conversation with Chris Barris when we toured with him. And it was around that time that, I switched to in-ear monitors, which I'd, I'd used before and hated um, because I always felt like it, it sort of took me out of the live performance and away from the um, the audience elements of it. But I started using in-ears and it started to save my voice a little bit. And then, um, yeah, I've, I've worked a lot of my voice over the last three years to, to you know, develop a, a style that's my way of singing as well. I think I think I used to kind of perhaps impersonate people in a, in a certain way. But yeah, you've got yeah. to find your own voice, really. And with the in-ears, what are you hearing back? Is that just your vocals? Or are you hearing your guitar and all as well? Well, I'll tell you what, some, we heard something quite strange on the recent tour. We played a show in Oxford, and we've got this intro track, which is a John Carpenter like instrumental from Halloween. When we started the first song, the intro music started again in my in-ears. So I'm singing straight to hell. And in the background, I've got this <laughs> all the way through the song. And um, after we finished the track, I was like, could you could you hear that? And Laz and Filippo are like, we couldn't hear anything, man. We just heard the song. And I was like, for God's sake, in my in-ears, I had the intro track again. No. So anyway, when, I use in, uh, when I'm using the in-ears, usually I don't get John Carpenter going through my, you know, the right channel in, and blowing my ears out. Um I mainly use it for vocals, guitar, because um, that's really what I want to hear in my in ears. Yeah. But it's it's also helped, I think, protect my hearing as well. I think when I was younger, you know, like a lot of people probably coming into doing shows in the late nineties, in the two thousands, weren't looking after their ears particularly well. We we did, it was a wasn't really the sort of thing. You know, I used to go out to clubs and not wear ear protection. So. Um, you know, I don't want to. You know, I don't want to be deaf by the time I get to forty. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, so yeah. I mean, I absolutely love them, and I think that uh, I can't believe that I went for so many years being this. I was like this snobby old school rocker who was like, "Oh, you don't want to use in ears," but I know that I sing better with them, and that's the main thing. Yeah, I can imagine just trying to keep that control because um, I remember watching. I was at Bloodstock last year, so it was Bloodstock, and um, a couple of bands just obviously fresh back after the pandemic, and nobody had really had any practice at all. So, like vocally, they were just all over the show. You know, I think it was more adrenaline than anything else because of just like uh, getting back out on stage again for the first time. And I know, like when you're trying to control your voice, it's almost like a pressure cooker, is if somebody's just lifting the lid off it, you know, and your voice can just go everywhere if you're if not uh, able to control that. So, a very useful tool for sure. Um, I think I think when we all came back after, you know, not performing in that environment, performing live for such a long time, it was strange. And um, I remember the first show, we, we did a festival called Love Rocks last summer and we went full out on that show. Like, you know, we'd not played on that sort of scale of stage for ages. And um, I totally blew my voice out doing that gig because I was giving it... And I'd been listening to a load of Gajira, actually, around that period, and I'd been... <laughs> And then afterwards, it's like one of the tracks that did this sort of like weird Gajira roar. And it's like, where the hell did that come from? It sounded terrible. I've never done it <laughs> since. But I remember after the gig, my drummer, Felipe, was just drenched and he, he yeah. stumbled down the steps into the backstage bit. And he goes, oh, man, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. 
And I was like, yeah, man. He, the song, the new songs are quite energetic, and I think he overdid it on track one. So yeah, there we go. I think so. Yeah, like as I say, so many people just like literally went for it. You know, the the adrenaline of being back on stage after being uh, cooped up for two years, and like physically, <laughs> I'd see people just broken coming off the stage. It was uh, yeah. As, as were the crowd. The crowd were like so enthusiastic. Uh, it's having live music again. It was great to see. Um, well, it's like the voc- vocals. It's a muscle. So it's like yeah. if I, you know, if you try to run a ten k. But you'd you'd never done the the build up exercise to it. You would struggle. So touring, like we've just done it. We're just about finished this tour. We've only got one more show to go. But you know, I'm singing better now than I was at the beginning of it because I, you know, I've been on the road for. Well, we started touring again really in October. So you you just build up the strength. Um, but you know, you 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 can't just go out and do a two hour show without doing that prep. So I've learned that as well. Yeah, and do you do warm up beforehand before you, see you go on stage? Yeah, I do, and I'm sure it's the sort of thing where it sounds absolutely ridiculous to other people. But um, yeah, I mean, I've even got steamer now, which I never used to use. I mean, it, me from Make about sure five no years in ago. Those shirts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but me from about five years ago, the sort of beer swigging whiskey drinker would just be like looking at me now, going, "What the hell are you doing?" But it's about being professional about it. And it, it, the, the the main aim is to deliver every single night the best show for people that are coming to see your shows. And there's no point doing the first three gigs on a 14-day tour and them all being great, but then by gig five, you're, everybody's spent in the band. So yeah. we just want to deliver the best show every night. And all these little tips and tricks that I've picked up from people like Chris Barris, you know, um, you know, and it's funny because we're, we're, like I say, at Winter's End this week and you end up having chats with younger bands than me and passing on that knowledge as well. And sort of, you sound like, um, I'm sure they're just looking at me going, oh, I don't give a shit what you're telling me. But, you know, you just, you want to help people. And yeah. definitely vocally, I, I think I've learned how to to sing in a more kind of um, professional manner and make sure that 14 dates in, I'm as good as I am on date one. Yeah. Absolutely, you got to look after yourself because, um, as we've all found as well with COVID, like the amount of tours that went off with people being sick, and you know, it's it's heart wrenching for the band to, to do that mid tour, but and for the fans as well. So, like, if you're not looking after yourself health wise, you're not going to make it through it from start to finish, are you? Yeah, and I think that we, we've a big part of what I've always done has been that kind of meet and greet. Well, is that the right terminology? You know, just hanging out with people after shows. Um, and I'm still doing that. We've been very fortunate in that we've got through the tour and nobody nobody got COVID. It might be because we all got it before we went on tour. So right back in September, uh, I actually got it about three weeks before we went on the tour in October. So although that was awful and I felt like crap, it meant that I kind of had this sort of immunity from it for a bit. So I managed to get through the tour and I could go and hang with people at the bar afterwards and sign merch if they want it signed. Um, but yeah, you've got to try and keep everybody as fit and healthy as possible. And um, we, we try to do that, definitely. Yeah. And speaking of COVID, how was your lockdown experience? How did you find that sort of period? Yeah, I think initially I, f- I found it quite difficult mentally. And I, I think that's probably because um, out, even outside of going out and gigging, I'm quite a sociable person. I, I I like to go out in London, go to gigs. So when I come back from tours, you know, I'll probably go out and, and see a show. And like this week, I, w- I went down to see Smith Cotson in Islington. And I, that would be kind of the normality for me two years ago, would be get back from a tour on Sunday, like we did with Winter's End, got home. And then on the, the Tuesday night, you go out and see a show. And that's how I relax. And so having that um, lack of sociable experiences really did affect me I, I like going out and meeting people and going for a drink with them and uh you know and even like I wasn't able to play football I you know, can see my football guys and so I, I did find that a bit weird but like a lot of people you've got to I think we all learn to adapt in different ways and I did a lot of songwriting I wrote you know probably two records worth of material which would never have been written had I been still touring so you, you just learn to take the positives from it. And I always thought, you know, even though this is a bit weird and I'm confined to my flat, my flat and missing the sociable side of it, there were, there were people in a way worse position than I was. So, you know, yeah, yeah. It, was all, it was okay. 
yeah. And um, you were saying there about obviously the, the writing side of it, you were able to write during that period. Um, I'm assuming then, like, as you say yourself, it's trying to find time sometimes to do those things. Like some people will write on a tour bus if they're out on the road for a long time, but would you normally like to sit down and block off a period to do a bit of writing or is it just something that sort of happens naturally? Yeah, I mean, I've never been the sort of person to say, uh, you know, I'm going to take two months off in September to write a record. And I've been in bands and I've played guitar, you know, for artists who work like that. I just have never really been able to do that. And so, like, actually what I found really inspiring was being on tour over the last sort of six weeks. So I've written, I think I've written seven songs over the last month. And that's because of the experience of being back playing live. So, you know, I bought this Les Paul a couple of weeks ago and this is inspiring. I always find buying new gear inspiring. So, you you know, you get, and that's always an excuse for me to buy more and more guitars. But, um, you well, know, every, got... every guitar you buy, doesn't it? Like there's something that it'll, it'll bring something different out of you. You know, like, if, and you're not really a Strat player, but like if you picked up a Strat, it would, you'd play differently on it compared to the way you'd play on the Les Paul. So you, yeah. you always find an instrument will, will draw something out of you. Yeah, absolutely, man. Or pedal or whatever it might be. I mean, I bought this, um, I picked it up on eBay. It's an MXR uh, Eddie Van Halen phaser pedal. And I, I'd, I'd wanted one for ages and then it was, it was on there for about 50 quid. So I just bought it. And that inspires you to write something that is a little bit outside your comfort zone. And I think gear can work that way. Um, I mean, people, I did a photograph of my, my pedal board on Instagram a couple of weeks back and people were asking me questions about it. And they asked what was the most important pedal on my board. So I'm just staring at it down here. And this is the most important pedal. And I bought yeah. this pedal back in about 98, this Boss Equalizer pedal. And it's still running. It's never broke. And it's always been on my board. And, you know, that's the the regular thing. But I wouldn't say this is an inspiring pedal to write new tunes to. No, but it, it's it, I've seen, like, I've watched many a video on YouTube on equalizer pedals, and then the guys will talk about the importance of it, you know, for either bringing something to something or taking something out of it, you know, for just shaping the sound, as you say, as a boost or as, uh, you know, reducing low end, whatever you need, whatever you need it for. You know, it's a, a really valuable tool. Well, what I try to do with the amps is I, I don't use too much gain through the amps. So I've got more of a sort of clear tone when I'm doing the rhythm stuff, but then I kick the equalizer in for the solo. So it just gives me that sort of boost. Um, but do I you, think- Do you use a boost pedal or, or a, um, like an overdrive or a distortion at all as well? Yeah, I mean, I've used various stuff over the years. Um, I've currently got an MXR overdrive on there. But um, one thing I was thinking about adding back in was a fuzz pedal. I've not used one of them for quite some time. Um, I got really into fuzz pedals when I, I, I became obsessed with the Black Crows in the, like, the mid-2000s and obsessed with Mark Ford. And he had various different, um, you know, different fuzz pedals that he was always using. So... Um, actually, this geezer that was um, making fuzz pedals for Mark Ford over in Los Angeles sent me one. He shipped one over to me for free. So I had that on my board, but I've I've lost the bloody pedal. I don't know where <laughs> it, it was, like, probably left at a gig somewhere. But um, fuzz is good. But, uh, yeah, it's weird. I, I don't really – I've got loads of effects and stuff that I stick on the board, but, like, the um, Electro Harmonics uh, Micro Pog, I don't use it much. I mean, it's the sort of thing that – everybody had those pog pedals about 10 years ago and suddenly everyone's recordings have pog on and like rival sons became this big band didn't they that were using it and actually i thought used it in a really great way but i just became sick of it i mean i still got it on my board but god there was a period where it's like any band that were bringing out singles and everybody had pog on it it's like oh yeah but with something new yeah so well, i think I, I react a little bit to that where I, i'm like i need i don't want to sound like everything else you know yeah 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 and um you you i suppose the 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 time delays and stuff like that there are the sort of interchangeable you'll just you'll just take them in and out depending on what takes your fancy or what sort of set you're playing yeah i mean i've much to the annoyance of my band i mean it, i think i i alter sets mid set with the i feel the vibe of the room and i i've always been you know, I was bang on in interviews about how Neil Young is, has always been a big inspiration to me. And, you know, that kind of ability to be off the cuff and and be in the moment and 
switch out a guitar because you're you're not feeling that guitar that night or whatever. Uh, we'll switch out a Les Paul for a Les Paul. But you know, it's sort of um it's the same with effects. Like I might use that the phase 90 on something at the moment, or I've got you know a chorus pedal down there that I might whack on for a solo or whatever. But that's part of the fun of it, isn't it? I think you, you just have to think on the spot and you know make sure that you keep because it, it's a bit when you've toured an album as well for six months and you're playing the, the songs on multiple shows, you've got to make them sound exciting and different for yourself. And I always think that the studio recording of a track is the beginning of a journey with that song. And then you, you unleash it and you can evolve a song over a, a tour and turn it into something else. Yeah. It's, it's interesting as you sort of touched on that, like, cause obviously it must be tough for bands who have those big hits to constantly regurgitate them out. Cause people have that expectation and come back and hear the song exactly as it is, you know, like Bon Jovi living on a prayer or something like that there, where it's just got as mm -hmm. many hundreds of thousands of times they've played it. Yeah. And I think, uh, it must be, I don't know, man. It, it, I, I, could, I was about to say it must be hard for these bands to be forced to play a song all the time because people want to hear it. I suppose the closest I've got to that is that there's a song of mine called I Will Follow You, which people always want me to play. And it doesn't get old because people always sing along with it and they, yeah. they always respond to that moment that night. So um, I just remember that like Noel Gallagher saying that why he, he, he always plays Wonderwall and they're like, do you always get, you must surely be sick of that song. And he's like, well, when you've got 15,000 people singing it back at you, how can you get sick of it? Yeah. I don't have 15,000 people singing my <laughs> song back at me, but you know, there's 50, like, yeah, it's all yeah. right. <laughs> and um, so what, what's on the cards for you next then? Are they, what, what, are you, you're out in tour, you just finished, have you just finished out the, you've done the winter's end there at the weekend? Yeah. Yeah. So we got one more show and then um, we've got about two months off, which actually what I'll probably do in that period, uh, is work on the new material, get some more stuff sorted. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm in a bit of a creative flow right now with, with songwriting, so hopefully that continues and I can write some more tunes and finish off. I don't know what the next album will be. I, I quite fancy doing something which is a bit more um, like dual guitar sort of stuff. And I mean, I've been in bands with guitarists in the past. It always seems to fall apart because... So probably partly my own ego, but then it, <laughs> other guitarists can get that happens with, with them as well, perhaps. But um, the collaboration, yeah, I mean, collaboration, bring somebody in for a song or something like that. I think so. Yeah. I mean, it'd be quite good to do something just a little bit different, but we've got, yeah, two months off and then we're basically touring the current record. Uh, we're going to Europe and we're going to, we've got a two week tour of Spain that we're going to be doing. And then we've got another UK tour that's going to be announced. I'm going to America as well in June, which will be really cool. Um, so it's going to be a, like a busy second half of the year. Basically, I've, I've taken a bit of time off after this current tour because I'm going to get married. So uh, I needed a, oh, a, bit of, a bit of a break to, uh, to you know, to relax and enjoy that. So it's going to be great in terms of like uh, hit, hitting the road and touring this, this album and going to different countries. I just you know, having not been able to do that for such a long time. And we always love going to Spain. I mean, we went to Brazil um, just before the pandemic. And what's great about those countries is you've got a real kind of core group of rock fans who are quite young. So you get a lot of young people at shows, which, you know, it's, it's great no matter what age it is that's coming to your show. But when you've got like, you know, 15, 16 year olds, it, you feel like you're inspiring to pick up the guitar that's what it's all about for me. You know, we need to kind of foster that next generation to be into rock and roll. So um, I do enjoy going to places like Spain and we, we were supposed to be going back to Brazil last year. We potentially might be going to Brazil at the end of this year, but we, uh, I think it's probably going to be next year that we do that, but that'd be yeah. cool when it happens. And do you think there's, I always think there's a bit of a rose tinted glasses thing where um, either foreign countries will look at British artists with uh, admiration and then for example we would look at American bands you know we've been you know great so when, when they come across to us we're really open arms we're like so yourself going across to Spain or going across to Europe or South America you'll be greeted with open arms because you're you're so different to what they see day in day out yeah it was it was quite crazy and a little bit overwhelming for me when I went to Brazil because 
Um, like, like the Beatles, the first... was it? Get the Beatles coming off the plane. <laughs> They're all screaming it at was, you. And... It, yeah, well, it was like we, we turned up at one of the venues, and I'm not kidding you, they had like a 30 foot, maybe even bigger than that. It was like the whole side of the building was my face. <laughs> And I was like, there's, there's more, like the other members of the band are more handsome than me. And like, um, it was just really weird. I was like, what the hell is this about? And we did this festival and it was, there were 8,000 people at this festival, right? And we got out of the bus because we had a bus, like we don't even have a bus in this country. <laughs> and there's a group of these three guys, these really young Brazilian guys, and they were shouting my song at me. And I turned around to Felipe, the drummer was like, what, the, what this is really weird like yeah. you know what was really funny about that tour was because it felt like it did feel like we were zeppelin at the beginning of song remains the same way you just felt really big and famous and it it felt very surreal and then we flew back to the uk and we were doing a, a festival in Sittingbourne, and um it was hilarious we got on stage and we were really kind of like yeah we've just done a you know we've been in brazil for a month we're we're rock stars we was on stage and the first song, there was a woman at the front and she just went like this. <laughs> Put her hands over it. And I, I was just like, brought back down to earth. There yeah. we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's crazy though. It's crazy. It's, it's, it is the truth, the reality of it. Um, so how, how do you feel about the touring aspect for the rest of the year? Are you confident that it is going to happen? Is, is the word out there that they, they feel it is going to happen okay? Everything is behind us now? Yeah, I mean, most of the industry people I'm talking to, just before we did this interview, um, a couple of hours ago, I was on the phone to, um, you know, uh, one of my mates over in LA, just talking about going over there in, in the summer. And there was no discussion about it not happening. It was all about this is what is going to happen in June. Um, I think, you know, like talking to the promoters in Spain, it's kind of strange because I think that, you know, England obviously seemed to have opened up quicker than most places. So you suddenly had this splurge of bands wanting to come yeah. and tour here because the restrictions were less. But yeah, it seems to be that it's, uh, you know, firing on all cylinders for the rest of the year. But, you know, as we saw over the last two years, I, I think what it's taught me is to not take anything for granted because things can change super quick. You know, when I was recording my record, we had... I remember one, um, we had like a week blocked out to do, because we did it in two set sections where we, we basically tracked most of it live, did the drums and bass. Then I was going back to do all the guitar overdubs and vocals. And then it was like Boris came on and said, right, from Monday, we're all shut again. And I'd got like five days in the studio to finish my record. And so, yeah, you just had to adapt to things and be flexible. Um, and I'm a bit of a... I guess I'm a bit of a workaholic. So when people say, when I'm told, no, you can't go to work and no, you can't go and do a gig, it, you know, I had to learn to be a little bit more forgiving of the, of the situation, I suppose. Yeah. But fingers crossed, we will be in Spain and we will be going to Switzerland and France and various other places. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Fingers crossed. As you say, it was disappointing even here because at the start of the year, there was a lot of big gigs announced like Tremonti and Gaugier and all were supposed to come through and then, Again, the uncertainty in Europe, just things in different flux. So um, those things fell by the wayside, but they've all sort of rescheduled again. And it seems like there's every band in, under the sun is literally coming to the UK now over the summer. So it's going to be a, yeah. a crazy busy time. Yeah, Gajira, they've been pushed back to next year, haven't next they? Next year, yeah. I, I was speaking to the, one of the promoters like last year and he was told to hold those dates for three years. You know, that's how bad it was. It was just the, the uncertainty. So... You know, it was disappointing when it dropped because we were so looking forward to like, like it was going to be the start of a new thing. 2022 was going to be the year, but now we're close to World War Three. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what, do we, yeah, gosh. What, what do we do? You know, crazy. Well, that was I was supposed to be going to Russia on tour this year. So obviously that's off. Yeah. Uh, and I've been to Russia and toured. I did a tour there about four years ago and it was great. And the, the venues were cool. The people I met were amazing. Um and so, yeah, that when I chatted to the promoter about it all being pulled, obviously there's much bigger things happening in the world right now. But, um, you know, I feel sad for him because he's obviously very gutted about what's going on, doesn't agree with what's going on, obviously. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, there's no, no winners in that situation at all. Like, even the Russian people themselves are, are going to be very hard done by um, off the back of all this as well. So it's, it's an absolute mess, to say the least. 
I, I watched we sorry, I was going to say, I watched a wee interview with um, Ingve Malmsteen once, and he was just talking about, did you ever see his Live in Leningrad video from many years ago? Yeah. And I sort of assumed it was a one-night gig that he played, but it turned out he was actually there for 30 nights. <laughs> he literally was playing a month of gigs at the stadium, <laughs> night after night after night, and the, la- the the concert was like recorded in the last night of the gig, you know? So he, uh, crazy, he was like massive in Russia, nobody knew about it. Yeah. Well, that's the thing when you, like, I remember doing, the, I did this tour of the Czech Republic a few years ago, and it was brilliant. Like, the, the, the culture in that in those, well, the Czech Republic was just such a beautiful place to go to, um, but they didn't want to uh, let me leave at the end of, you know, like, in this country, there's, like, uh, particularly in London, like, I was at Smith Cotson the other night, and um, London's really funny because it's, like, the, the city that never sleeps, except it does because everyone's got a curfew, which is 10 o'clock. And uh, it's weird because you go to other countries and they're just like, keep playing. It's like, yeah. well, I've already been on for two hours. Like, you know, we've got to drive to the next. And it's just like, yeah, no, I just keep. And they don't, they don't want you to stop. And I, yeah. I think there's just something really heartwarming about that, really. Yeah, and long may it last. That's, uh, that's uh, live the good times as, as long as we can, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Well, fingers crossed. I mean, it's been, just been great to be. It has felt a little bit more like a return to normality though, well, since the new year. And um, as I said, when I went to see Smith Cotson the other night, it was just great to see loads of people I've not seen and just not be gigging. And Because, you know, when you're gigging, you're, you're doing a load of different stuff and you're managing the night and just to be able to go out to a show and have a few non-alcoholic beers, but have a few beers prior to the show and uh, catch up was just amazing. So fingers crossed we're at the... Uh, you know, we can see light at the end of the tunnel in terms of COVID. Let's just hope that we're not in, you know, bloody World War Three in a, in a few weeks. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. And how did you find the Smith Cotton gig? It was good, man. Yeah, um, I'd never really listened much to Richie Cotton in terms of like, I mean, I was aware of him obviously, and I'd, I'd sort of come across um, a couple of albums. I think I owned a couple of albums, but um, yeah, it it. I, th- I really like that record and, and it was cool because when um when I got that record obviously um Kevin Shirley he, he did the mix on it and um he it was around that time that um I sort of hooked up and uh spoke to Kevin about him doing some of my stuff so when he said about what's coming up later on in the year there's some tracks that I've done with Kevin Shirley that will be coming out as a as an EP, but we, we're sort of working, still finishing that off and that'll probably come out the tail end of the year, but to have him do that. And it was cool because he'd just done the Smith Cotson record. So um, that was quite special. Just sort of chatting about that and saying, you know, that's a great record. And he's, uh, he's worked with the greats, hasn't he? You know, everything from Zeppelin through to Bonamassa and just a, a monster of a producer. Like, yeah, man. I mean, one of the first albums I bought was by your side, um, Black Crows. Did he do the production on that? He did the Black Crows live at the Greek, didn't he? Um, with Jimmy Page. And and so Kevin Shirley was this name that I saw when I was a teenager that I associated with just badass rock records. Yeah. And so to have him do some of my stuff was just really great. And what he likes is it he doesn't like the kind of overprodu- overproduced kind of auto-tuned contemporary rock sound. Like if you listen to the Maiden album, the it sounds like a band, you know. Sounds like a it sound, Nico sounds like a drummer yeah. that is playing the songs, and and that that was something that brought a new um, element to to my music. So I'm I'm excited for people to hear what he's done on those four songs because I think they're really cool. Yeah, yeah. And do you, like did you work with him uh, when recording, or is it more just for him mixing and? So the way that we did it, I mean, he's in Sydney. So the way that we did it was we were essentially recording the tracks. Um, we went over to Anki Baby Studios in Kent and um, it was all done via like we transfer. So you're sending in the, all of the different um, elements. And then um, the, then I record, it's funny because I recorded the vocals for one of the songs um, at a studio, a really tiny studio down in... Um, south london in this studio it's called shoebox studios right and the, the track sounds it sounds massive but i i know the way the vocals were recorded <laughs> we're in this tiny little room but i mean we recorded the track 
you know, live in a studio because that's what he what, what Kevin goes for. But then when I did the vocals on that one particular song, I was in this tiny little box studio, but it, it sounds ginormous. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, getting those mixes back from Kevin, I was just like, oh, my God, Kevin Shirley's mixed some of my songs. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what people think of them when they come out later on in the year. Yeah, I just I was thinking of the, um, I think I watched that Joe Bonamassa documentary, The Guitar Man. And yeah, I sort of showed, showing you footage of like Kevin and him working together and like the way Kevin would push him, you know, the the just 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 as a guitar player and as a musician, you know, challenges him all the time really to, to do special things. So I'd say working certainly one on one face to face would be quite a quite an experience. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason that Kevin was doing that sort of stuff for, you know, emerging artists was that he he was in Sydney and couldn't travel to yeah. um America to do. I mean, I think he's he's been over, hasn't he, to work with Joe over the last month or so. But um, you know, he so he had a bit of spare time. So yeah, was, yeah. there were some fortuitous elements about the lot, you know, the lockdown and COVID. That um, there's no way I don't think I, I I just don't think he would have worked on those songs. And it you know just to have Kevin Shirley do a mix of my songs is um, is quite special. So the, it would be brilliant one day to be in a studio with him, working with him in that. Yeah capacity yeah, but um absolutely. for now this will do <laughs> dare to dream dare to dream sir you know yeah man <laughs> <laughs> well look jack like absolute pleasure talking to you won't keep you much longer um great hearing you and hopefully as we say before we'll get you across the pond sometime we'll get to see you or else maybe i'll get my ass across on a plane over to england yeah man it'd be lovely to meet you in person and uh, yeah. you know have a chat in person absolutely well look thanks again for your time man uh, absolute pleasure talking to you jack j hutchinson cheers mark okay take care dude talk to you soon